multivariable calculus. As the name suggests, it is made up of two things, multivariables, in our context, vectors, and calculus, which is the process of differentiation and integration. We're going to take many of the things we learned in single variable calculus and jack it up to two and three dimensions. However, the result is a little bit complicated. So we'll establish these results one step at a time, and along the way, acquaint ourselves with very useful tools in multivariable calculus, such as the partial derivative, multiple integrals, and the trifecta of the Green's theorem, Stokes' theorem, and divergence theorem, all of which can be treated as generalizations of the fundamental theorem of calculus. We'll start with vectors. There are two crucial ways to multiply vectors. The first way is the dot product, which is essentially a sum product of the components, and the cross product, which is obtained by calculating the determinant that produces a vector. In higher dimensions, we can talk about geometry as well. The first of these objects is a line, which in a single variable has the equation y equals to mx plus c. In single variables, c can be treated as the starting point and m can be treated as the direction of the line. When considering lines in higher dimensions, this idea gets carried forward. The vector equation of a line starts with a fixed point A and travels in the direction D. Doing a bit of algebra, we can obtain the Cartesian equation of a line in three dimensions, and in principle, this can extend to any number of dimensions you wish. Increasing the dimension by one increases the degree of freedom by one, and this two-dimensional flat object is known as a plane. Its vector equation is similar to that of a line. It starts off with a fixed point A, it travels S units in the direction U, and T units in the direction V. We can actually write this as a scalar product, where N is the cross product of U and V. The cross product U and V gives a vector that's perpendicular to both of them. We call this vector N for the normal vector. As such, the scalar product equation of the plane tells us, roughly speaking, the direction of a plane through its normal vector. By doing a bit of algebra on the scalar product equation, we can obtain this Cartesian equation of a plane as well. Just like in single variable calculus, we deal with quadratic curves. Likewise, in higher dimensions, we talk about new objects called the quadric surfaces. These quadric surfaces are essentially a sum of quadratic terms. And if we were to switch the plus to minus, we'll obtain the various types of quadric surfaces. In single variable calculus, our functions take in one-dimensional inputs and give out one-dimensional outputs. However, in multivariable calculus, we are interested if the output is multidimensional. This is in fact a way to generalize our idea of lines as we have talked about before. Furthermore, we would like to consider functions whose inputs are multidimensional and whose outputs are one-dimensional. Functions of this form are firstly generalizations of single variable functions, as well as generalizations in some sense of planes and quadric surfaces as we have previously discussed. And lastly, we are interested in functions that take in multiple dimensions and produce multiple dimensions. These functions are the trickiest to deal with, and yet we do have techniques to deal with them in one way or another. Moving on to differentiation, dealing with functions whose inputs are multidimensional, a very natural process is to take the partial derivative, which is to differentiate with respect to a single variable and treating all the other variables as constant. For example, taking the partial derivative of x squared y cubed with respect to x, we differentiate the x squared to get 2x and we'll treat y cubed as constant so that the result is 2x times y cubed. Likewise, taking the partial derivative with respect to y, we'll differentiate the y cubed to get 3y squared and treat the x's as constants. A natural question to ask is, can differentiation with respect to different variables be swapped around? While the general answer is no, in the special case when the second order partial derivatives are continuous, this is legitimate and is given the name Clairaut's theorem. Furthermore, if the function is sufficiently well behaved, taking partial derivatives is enough for us to determine the behavior of the entire function, 
This is known as the chain rule, and it's the same chain rule that we saw in single variable calculus, just jacked up to multiple variables. In single variable calculus, derivatives help us talk about tangent lines. Likewise, in multivariable calculus, partial derivatives help us talk about tangent planes. Just like how the equation of a tangent line is determined by a point and the gradient of the tangent, the equation of the tangent plane is determined by a point r0 and the gradient of the function at the point r0. But more about the gradient in just a moment. While partial derivatives tell us the gradient of the function with respect to x and y, directional derivatives are asking the question about finding the gradient with respect to any unit vector in any direction. Directional derivatives can be defined similar to partial derivatives, and the calculation is even more interesting because it's simply the dot product of the gradient of the function with the direction that we are interested in. The gradient of the function is known as the gradient vector, and it is obtained by taking partial derivatives with respect to the various dimensions. Using gradient vectors, we can calculate directional derivatives in terms of dot products and tangent planes in a manner reminiscent of that of single variable tangent lines. Just like in single variable calculus, we are interested in the extrema of a multivariable function. To do that, we obtain its critical values, which happens when the gradient of the function is zero. And under some added constraints, we'll use the method of Lagrange multipliers, which requires us to compute the Lagrangian and find the extrema of this Lagrangian by solving the equation, the gradient of L equals to zero. Moving on to integration, a very natural analog of single variable integration is multivariable integration. To calculate the full theory takes a lot of effort, and we're going to break it down into several steps. Usually in integration, we'll integrate over a one-dimensional set. Double and triple integrals help us integrate over two-dimensional and three-dimensional sets respectively. If the domain is rectangular, we can use iterated integrals to calculate the double and triple integrals in a relatively straightforward manner. However, we are interested in integrating over much more general domains. Most of the domains we encounter are either type 1, type 2, or type 3, where double integrals can be calculated via single integrals, and triple integrals can be calculated via double integrals. Sometimes, the domains satisfy some circular properties, and in these situations, it is useful to consider polar, cylindrical, and spherical coordinates. These are specialized substitutions that capture the circular behavior of the domains. And usually, the integral on the right side is either a type 1, type 2, or type 3 integral, which we can calculate using usual techniques. Finally, if we are interested in a much more generalized substitution, we will use the Jacobian transformation. The Jacobian is the determinant of a bunch of partial derivatives, and just like the polar and cylindrical and spherical case, Jacobian transformations help us capture the moving parts of our initial integral and convert it into a type 1, type 2, and type 3 integral, which we can integrate using standard techniques. Up till now, we've been doing calculus on functions whose inputs are multidimensional and whose outputs are one-dimensional. These functions are given the special name of a scalar field, and functions whose inputs and outputs are multidimensional are known as vector fields. In fact, curves are a special kind of vector field. They are functions whose inputs are one-dimensional and whose outputs are multidimensional. We can also consider surfaces as special types of vector fields whose inputs are two-dimensional and whose outputs are multidimensional. Scalar fields have been very useful for us up till now, and now we can consider taking the integral of a scalar field over any generalized curve. These are called line integrals of scalar fields, and it generalizes the arc length formula in single variable calculus. But if we can consider the integral of a scalar field, it would be really nice to consider the integral of a vector field as well. We can define the line integral of a vector field in an analogous manner. Here, the dot product captures the fact that f of rt, being a vector field, is multidimensional. But line integrals of a vector field may be a little bit more complicated. To handle line integrals of a vector field, if the curve is sufficiently nice, it can be calculated via a double integral. This is known as Green's theorem, 
and there's a little bit of partial differentiation needed in the process. Another way to calculate integrals of vector fields is if the vector field is conservative. This means that the vector field is actually the gradient of some scalar field. And likewise, we have the fundamental theorem of line integrals, which says that if the vector field can be written as the gradient of the scalar field, then the line integral over the curve is the difference of the endpoints. If we integrate over one-dimensional objects such as curves, can we integrate over two-dimensional objects such as surfaces? In a similar manner as before, we can define the surface integral of a scalar field and with a little bit of care and concern, define the surface integral of a vector field in an analogous manner. Surface integrals are really useful because it helps us calculate line integrals via Stokes theorem. Stokes theorem connects the line integral of a vector field with the surface integral of its curl, which is defined as a cross product between the gradient operator and the vector field, and essentially, the curl captures how much rotation there is in the vector field. Stokes theorem tells us that the line integral of a vector field is precisely equal to the surface integral of its curl. And with several special cases, we can see that Green's theorem is actually a special case of Stokes theorem. Finally, we are interested in calculating the surface integral of vector fields. This once again proves to be a daunting challenge, but once again, if our domain of integration is relatively nice, we can calculate surface integrals via the divergence theorem. The divergence theorem tells us that the surface integral of a vector field is the triple integral of its divergence, where the divergence is the dot product of the gradient operator and the vector field. And roughly speaking, the divergence measures how outward looking the vector field is. These ideas in multivariable calculus introduce to us the techniques needed to make sense of the multi-dimensional world that we live in. This is multivariable calculus in a nutshell.